Thank you. We're very fortunate to have Catherine Azelstad, professor of history at WVU and a specialist on German history. War and society in the 19th century is her primary research area. She's published articles on war and gender, Republican political culture in the Hanseatic cities, the civilian experience of Napoleonic warfare, aftermath of the wars on the German Confederation. Her current research, After the Wars, German Central Europe After the Napoleonic Conquest, 1815 to 1848, is supported by research grants, a Fulbright Research Scholarship, and an NEH Fellowship. At WVU, she teaches courses on modern Europe, German history, and 19th century Europe. And what she didn't put in her bio is that she danced with Martha Graham Company. <laughs> So I think that's a very important part of our bio, and we're very fortunate to have you. Thank you for coming, Catherine. Thank you very much for that kind invitation, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak to your congregation and to share some of the things that I um, have been working on when I teach about the Reformation and about Luther in particular. So what I'd like to do, I understand I have about 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes. I'd like to really talk about thinking about the origins of Protestantism, go back to um, focusing on the origins of Protestantism through Luther and the complex legacy that he left. So I'm gonna start a little bit by, by focusing on some of the very positive aspects of, of Luther's inheritance. I wanna talk then about kind of the key uh, initiatives that Luther was involved with and then how the Reformation grew really way beyond his control as it, the reform movement moved in other areas um, to other groups leading to um, Zurich, uh, John Calvin and, um, and Geneva and of course the rise of the Anabaptist movement to which of course is central to the history of the Mennonites and I want to talk about the problematic legacy of Luther um, with a few examples, and then wrap this up by focusing on the 500th anniversary of the, you know, the beginning of the Reformation, um, the nailing of 95 theses in 1517. We celebrated that in 2017, and wrap up with what the Ch Lutheran Church has done since then to apologize and reconcile this very divided inheritance or legacy from Luther and its, and its role um, in the earth. So that sounds ambitious, but I, I, hope to, um, I hope to make this as interesting as possible for everybody. Um, I was raised an Episcopalian, so when I had my confirmation, I didn't know a thing about Luther. So I, as a German historian, I've had to learn quite a lot. And it, he's a fascinating historical character, but very, very, very complex. And as I said, I want to emphasize how his influence really extends beyond the theological. And I want to talk about the theological too, but give you a few examples of what I mean. Um, if we think about, for example, what's considered the values and the conduct that's considered typically German, something I always have a little bit of a problem with because Germany is so diverse. Um, if we think about the aesthetics of Luther, his distaste for ornamentation, um, this can also be seen today in the very modest dress of an office decor of Angela Merkel, all, even her eating habits, who was the daughter of a Lutheran pastor. Um, we can also see this very clearly in, 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 across the board in literacy. Luther, of course, translated the Bible into um, what became standard high German, standardizing the German language really for the first time across very many dialects. And he also translated it in the Bible for regular people to read, making it pleasing to read almost song-like, and it became the central um, element for Protestant families and congregation was reading the Bible. Um, he also sought to not only increase literacy, of course, and he did this by encouraging schools. Um, and we see if, at, even at, towards the end of his life, there was a real expansion of schools at this time. Um, so that's all there, very important. The other thing I want to emphasize is he wanted everyone to be able to read the Bible 
the young, the old, women, and men. So he even encouraged education among women. Um, although much led in practice, that turned out much less than men. Um, and he he made learning a really kind a really intrinsic value. Um, so the process of education, learning, educating oneself and learning. He also had a huge impact on music. Luther translated Latin hymns into German and initiated new forms of spiritual music. Um, he incorporated reformist principles into his songs and he composed songs that are still sung today. In 1523, he composed 24 new songs in 12 months. He fostered the practice that the congregation should sing together in fellowship. He believed music was a divinely inspired weapon against the devil. We'll talk a little more about the devil later on. He wanted all believers to sing together in, um, in church, at home, and he believed that singing made the congregation active participants in the service, and that became a trademark of almost all Protestant um, denominations, turning the Reformation in many ways into a singing movement. Luther was also a, a devoted father who valued family, his wife and marriage, and his own children and those that he, had, that he and his wife adopted. And he welcomed everyone into his home, initiating this concept of the, the open and welcoming Protestant parsonage. He established this tradition and generosity to friends and students and set examples for communal Protestant fellowship, especially at mealtime. You always had a full group of people gathered around the table at mealtime to talk. And in critical situations, Luther demonstrated unwavering courage and determination, such as at the Diet of Worms. And he became a model for many future generations of Protestants confronted with political oppression. The example of Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his determination to defy and put a spoke in the wheel of National Socialism comes to mind when we think of Luther's example at Worms, as does the activities of the Protestant Church in East Germany um, that were focused on carving out a nonviolent and reform-oriented space during the 80s that at a very highly risky and turbulent time that helped lead to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yet, <laughs> um, Luther's, Luther's influence in politics and German history is very complicated. Um, in 1996, the president, Roman Hartzig, said, you can trace a direct line from Luther's teaching to today's concepts of freedom, freedom of conscience, equality in law, and solidarity with society's weaker members. Most people don't dispute that. At the same time, though, others ask, was Martin Luther the forerunner of modern German democracy or did his belief in obedience to the state prepare Germans for submission to Hitler? So his political legacy is far more, far more complex. So as I've described Luther, he is a very complex person, um, a complex historical figure. And in the words of one historian, young Luther and old Luther left very different legacies. Young Luther was a reformer monk, the warm, sociable Luther who loved joking with his friends, but as he grew older, he changed. Old Luther discarded friends, became surly and hostile in his writings. Um, and as his health declined, he became increasingly depressed and wrote that he had, he had lost Christ, which is very, very sad for a monk who sought to define a human relationship with God through theological reforms. Many historians prefer to overlook the old Luther uh, or the dark Luther, saying that his ideas are not important compared to his earlier achievements but I think we need to address both the young and the old Luther or the light and the dark Luther, however you wish to, to frame it. So what did Luther object to in his reform? Because one of the key things I, I, am, I emphasize when I teach Luther to my students is he wasn't trying to destroy the Catholic church. He wanted to reform it. And of course, many of you are probably familiar with a lot of these aspects. Um, he was very, very concerned about corruption in the Catholic church in particular, the selling of indulgences. Um, and the infamous Dominican monk, uh, Johannes Tenzel, who traveled from town to town in Saxony and other German states, staging big shows and performances. Um, I hate to say almost like a Trump rally, but something like that with lots of flags and whistles and music. And he would, um, and a band, and he would also say, listen to the voices of your dead. 
ancestors, your dead parents, your dead children. You can redeem their souls for a pittance by giving me money and I can give you a ticket to get them out of purg purgatory. purgatory. So this is the indulgence. And he targeted, of course, rich and poor, but a lot of poor people um, gave money to try and, and buy their, their, their loved ones out of purgatory. Luther thought this was completely corrupt because it wasn't in the Bible. Um, he also was angry at the money that was taken away from the poor and sent half of it to the Catholic Church to aggrandize St. Peter's and half of it when he going into the pockets of German Catholic princes. So he was outraged by this. And this is what led him, along with many other concerns of corruption in the church, to nail the 95 theses on the castle church in Wittenberg in 1517. And this led first to an academic kind of argument among a variety of reformers within the Catholic church. Once it was translated into German and broadly circulated, the debate took on a whole new level that also became highly political. Um, Luther was summoned to Rome, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> the elector Frederick um, ensure that there could be a hearing for him in Germany instead, or one of the German states. And um, <clears throat> this led to his growing conflict with the church, in particular, the Pope. He wrote several important works. I won't talk about all of them. All of them, though, focus on corruption within the Catholic Church, and that it was the obligation of the Holy Roman Empire emperor to lead reform as a good Catholic. Um, he also was very critical of the church practices, and he called, for example, of a reconsideration of what are considered real sacraments and claimed the only holy and necessary sacraments are baptism and communion. Um, he was also very increasingly critical of the Pope. This caused Pope Leo X to excommunicate Luther. Um, he was challenged for his heresy at the Diet of Worms. And after an agonizing self-questioning, this is the very famous statement he made. Um, he said, he basically said, here I stand, may God help me, amen. He didn't recant, recant any of his writings, any of his critiques of the Catholic Church or the Pope. He was almost, uh, he was on his way out of Worms when he was kidnapped by, fr by friends who brought him to Wartburg Castle. And that's where he translated the Bible, um, which was of course central for so many things as I've already described. I um, mean, he really made it, as I said, accessible to the mother in the home, the children in the street, the common man on the marketplace. That was the whole point of translating the Bible from Latin into, into German. Um, his key points of Luther's, Luther's ideology <clears throat> are pretty clear. Salvation based on faith, faith alone. Good works, indulgences, those things were not enough. Salvation was a gift from God and could not be bought. He also emphasized the scriptures as the basis of religious authority, not the Pope or the clergy. Rather, each individual needed a personal understanding of the Bible by reading it themselves. Um, <clears throat> he also was very concerned with, um, oops, I just lost one of my notes. Sorry. Anyway, um, he was also, this changed, of course, the whole notion of the clergy um, and where he would, he would the, the Protestant describe, belief was every man his own priest, where he also said the clergy is not sacred and holy. The clergy should marry. They're regular people. Their idea is not to interpret the word of God, but to work with people to, to help them and communicate the word of God as opposed to determine it. So for all these reasons, of course, this led to a tremendous change in the status of the clergy. He himself married a former nun um, and they had, I think, six children together and adopted an additional four more. So the whole status of the clergy as being something holy and not common um, caused a big change and a big ruckus within the Catholic church as well. I should also mention quickly the expansion of the reforms. So this, these are some of the key things that Luther was in charge of, but a lot of things happened in addition to this. For example, we see in, um, we see the spread of reform ideas across German Central Europe in some political ways, in particular, what's called the, the peasant war or the revolution of the common man. 
And this is when peasants who had learned to read the Bible decided they wanted to have certain rights. They wanted to be able to elect their own priest or determine whether they would be a, have a reform priest or a Catholic priest in their village. They also used the reform movement as a way to speak up for social injustices and the oppression of local lords. This led to an extremely violent and bloody peasants war. And I'll talk in a minute about how Luther responded to this. At the same time, Reformation ideas could not be bottled and patent with other reform ideas with Luther's name on it. So of course, other reformers are gonna hear Luther's words and engage in that and maybe even take it a little further. And if we look in um, Zurich, Zwingli, for example, agreed with Luther's reforms, but said, we need to get rid of all of the, um, the idolatry in the churches. Luther didn't agree with that necessarily. Then like um, saints necessarily, but he liked stained glass windows and other elements of, of, of church decor that was educational. So there's a real difference there. And he really attacked Zwingli for defacing churches, the traditional churches. Um, same thing with John Calvin and, and Geneva. He took the reforms in a very different way, focusing on this idea of the elect. And then of course we come to the Anabaptists, which were a large diverse group that included the Swiss brethren who spread their ideas across the Swiss cantons and into Austria, as well as a very charismatic figure called John of Leiden. Um, John of Leiden essentially um, initiated a, a kind of a violent coup of the city of Munster where he brought all of his followers and um, he, banned, he banned and he burned all other books in the Bible. Um, he there kind of initiated a dictatorship and a theocracy that talked about the common ownership of land, communal regulation of personal life, and threatened the power of the princes with these words. He also had himself king, the new, the new king of New Jerusalem, which he renamed Munster, um, and he executed... Um, his opponent, some of his opponents. This of course led to a terrible and very violent war in which the princes as well as other reformers, whether they were supporters of Zwingli or Luther or the Roman church, all amassed on Leiden or Munster and killed Leiden, John of Leiden, as well as many of his followers in a very gruesome ways. Gruesome death is very typical, sadly, in these religious conflicts. That really transformed Anabaptists, and I'll talk about their belief systems in a minute, into a very different kind of nonviolent group, especially led by Menno Simons, and especially found among Dutch Anabaptists, who decided to focus on calm, um, peaceful practices. And we see this evident in Menno Simons' own work, and he dedicated his life to the spread of peaceful and kind of evangelical ideas. Um, that stressed separation from the world and, and the, the idea to live like the early church and emulate the life of Jesus. Anabaptist beliefs though were not popular among other reformers. In particular, the idea of a rejection of infant baptism saying only adults should be baptized when they can say they want to be. And that they also said no one should be forced to accept the Bible, so they were after John of Leiden, more peaceful inclined, of course. They also adopted the practices of early Christianity. They considered all people, especially all people in the congregation to be equal and considered all people their own priests and all churches chose their own ministers. Um, so again, going against any kind of religious authority, traditional religious authority within Protestant churches. They also considered the church and the state to be completely separate and you'll, I'll talk in a minute about how that's not how Luther saw things at all. Um, and they felt that human law had no real power over Christians and that people who are real Christians cannot bear arms. And of course, this leads to the evolution of pacifism as well within the Anabaptist tradition. So <clears throat> despite Calvin and Zwingli and their ideas of reform, the Anabaptists seemed especially dangerous, taking the reform movement and what Luther and many others, including Zwingli, Calvin, and the Pope, thought was a real scary kind of um, 
um, extreme radical reform. So this brings us back then quickly to how did Luther respond to these changes and to other groups who, def who he perceived as defying him. I think one of the important things to remember when we're talking about Luther is to recognize the context of his time and how people in his time thought about these, thought about religion and thought about spirituality. Luther, for example, believed fundamentally that the Reformation represented a metaphysical culmination and a metaphysical confrontation between God and the Antichrist. So he completely believed in the devil, that the devil was present, running around all over the earth, causing mischief. He believed in the divine and the diabolical that were at constant ends with each other. We also know he separated from intense depression and anxiety, even as a young, a young monk. Um, tribulations he called and German Anfechtung or, or these kinds of like spiritual tribulations. He got nausea, constipation, ringing in his ears. He understood all of this less a physical condition and more devils and demons literally plaguing him. This was something he struggled with all his life, but as I suggested earlier, it only got worse. So he believed that demons were real and he viewed his enemies, especially the papacy, Turks, Jews, and a Baptist as agents of the devil. And this of course is where we move into the realm of kind of dark Luther. And I'll start with the Anabaptist. He disapproved of most of the reforms that exceeded his generally. And those of the radical reform, what's called the radical reformation, the Anabaptist, um, he really disapproved of. And he called for their death. He called for um, kind of their eradication, you know, not to that, that, that these ideas were fundamentally wrong and um, a complete exaggeration or gross misinterpretation of his reform ideas. He called them fanatics and he spent days and weeks in pamphlet wars with them over the meaning of baptism, the timing and the meaning of baptism. Um, like Catholic and other reform churches, um, Luther adamantly supported their suppression, exile and even persecution. Um, he joined forces with his opponents to fight the radical reformation relentlessly persecuting Mennonites in particular, executing their leaders, many of whom died through torture, burning, drowning, or beheading. Let's go on to some other moments, the peasant wars, for example. So the peasants, again, who took his ideas and applied them to social justice, Luther had no sympathy with them. Um, he criticized them for protesting against their lords, despite the ideals of freedom suggested in Luther's theology he supported obedience to the German princes, in particular at the height of the conflict in 1825, when it was especially violent, because we're talking about farmers fighting royal or princely militias. Um, he condemned rebellious peasants in the harshest words, calling them mad dogs and claiming those who killed them would be martyrs and earn eternal salvation. The German nobility responded by slaughtering in, in a very short period of time, 100,000 of the 300,000 armed peasants and farmers. Of course, his view on the papacy was especially toxic and it became increasingly negative as the reform movement continued until he lost all restraint with his accusations against the Roman church and the Pope. Luther attacked the Pope as the antichrist, the product of the devil, um, Luther wrote that Pope Paul II was a sodomite and transvestite, and the Catholic Church was filled with devils. He used a lot of, of what we would call potty language today that farted and defecated other devils, so creating devils through defecation. Anti-popery became a defining trait of Protestantism over time, and Luther inspired a whole series of woodcuts which were used for propaganda, um, not necessarily just kind of aesthetic things, but to spread the word. Um, one, for example, was called The True Depiction of the Papacy, published in Wittenberg in 1845, which was a series of horrific illustrations and presents the Pope and the Catholic Church as devils, monsters, and diabolical in all ways. Another one, The Birth and Origin of the Pope, depicts <clears throat> a monstrous Satan um, literally pooping out you know, an evil Pope. Um, all of these images were very, were very, very influential in popular culture where belief in the devil was common. 
and kind of plagued hatred towards other faiths, including Protestants towards Catholics. Woodcuts like these were only negative about the Catholic Church. And likewise, Catholics responded with their own propaganda and woodcuts. Um, one was very famous called Luther as the Devil's Bagpipe, which presented Luther as a pawn of the devil. What I wanna emphasize here is this visible and visceral hatred for each other um, and viewing either the Roman church or the reformed church as diabolical, heightened hostility and intolerance between the followers, of course, and led to new levels of violence during the 30 years war, which takes place um, from 1618 to 1648, when both faiths, both groups, including various reformers, killed each other with impunity, leaving one third of the German population dead. Luther also hated Turks. Um, he viewed them as demonic and dangerous, and he made several malicious comments about Islam and Muhammad. In the last two decades of his life, Luther feared, as did many Christians, both Catholic and Reform, that the Turks would take over Europe and destroy Christendom. His comments on Turks and Muslim were filled with the same kind of anger and fantasies of destruction that we see it towards Mennonite, towards the Anabaptist, as well as towards the Roman church. And then finally, for Germans, another, another enemy that Luther um, raged against were Jews. And in 1523, when he was still young or light Luther, he wrote an important pamphlet called that Jesus was born a Jew. And he regretted that Christians had treated Jews like dogs. And it was a very, it was a pamphlet that was oriented towards, you know, bringing Jews into the faith of the true Christ saying, of course, you wouldn't want to be a Christian in the Roman church. It's, it's corrupt, but an art with all, if you follow our beliefs, you can find the true Christ. And when, when Jews didn't respond by converting all mass, which is what he had hoped, he unleashed his fury on them and called for synagogues and Jewish holy books to be burned and houses to be destroyed. He did not recall, he never called for Jews to be killed, although he did say Christians had no moral responsibilities towards Jews if they rejected the real church. The real church. Like the Pope, um, Jews were considered diabolical and worked with the devil. He blamed evil stares from Jews on the illness that eventually killed him. His hostility, of course, towards the Jews was so strong that you know, several centuries later, uh, the National Socialists saw Luther as a hero because of his venomous writings. Um, in particular, one, may, one that he penned in 1543 called On the Jews and Their Lies. The National Socialists, of course, incorporated Luther, Luther's writings into their propaganda to justify their early policies of racial segregation and later wartime deportion and ultimately extermination. This has left one of the darkest shadows um, of Lutheranism in German history. So how to wrap this up? Um, what I guess what I want to focus on here is really good news. And that is a process of century long soul searching. And in particular, most recently in the last, I would say several decades following the second world war um, a real uh, examination among Protestants of what is valuable in Luther's inheritance and what was toxic. Um, and this, the anniversary, uh, anniversary of, the, of the Reformation in 2017 is a great place to give a few examples. This was viewed both by Catholics and Protestants as a chance to place Christ at the center of their relations. As Pope Francis said, when he welcomed an ecumenical delegation of Lutherans to Ger from, to, from Germany to, um, to Rome in February, 2017. The delegation included Catholic leaders and leaders of the evangelical church in Germany. And again, the Pope claimed that the Reformation anniversary, instead of being avoided or condemned by Catholics, offered a chance for all Christians to work towards reconciliation. And both Lutherans and Catholics issued the joint statement saying that it has become clear what we have in common is far more than what still divides us. So this ecumenical, ecumenical delegation focused on giving thanks and, un, and unison, unison for the Reformation 
as well as asking for forgiveness for the failures in the way Christians have wounded the body of Christ and defended each other over the past 500 years. This includes also Lutherans seeking reconciliation with Mennonites and Jews. In 2010, the Lutheran World Federation meeting in Stuttgart officially asked Mennonites for forgiveness, stating that Lutherans of the world deplored the injustices inflicted on Mennonites from their predecessors in the 16th century. Um, even before that, in 1994, the Lutheran World Federation and Church Council of Evangelical Church of America acknowledged with deep pain the anti-Semitic violent recommendations in Luther's writings and expressed deep and abiding sorrow at the tragic events they, con they contributed to. Um, in 2016, the Evangelical Church in Germany stated, we cannot bypass this history of guilt, the fact that Luther's anti-Judaic recommendations in later life were a source for Nazi anti-Semitism is a further burden weighing on the Protestant churches in Germany. So to sum up, the commemoration of Luther in 2017 really focused on religious pluralism, reconciliation and internationalism. Um, on this year, we became eight, in, in um, October 2017, became a national holiday and a day of celebration and festivities, but not one that did not go without serious introspection. Youth became very involved, nailing their own 95 theses on the, on the church wall. And there were special ecumenical celebrations across Germany. What was key, the key theme though, was diversity and tolerance. This was central to Angela Merkel's uh, message to encourage all German churches to promote a narrative of unity over division. And during her visit to All Saints Church, she asserted that whoever believes in diversity must also practice tolerance. And I think the focus on tolerance is the, is the best way to kind of wrap this up and you, because you can see with Luther's inheritance, Luther's legacy has been very divisive in many ways, very rich and very spiritually fulfilling for many, um, very tragic for others. And the recognition though of the influence of both has created a real consensus to moving forward with diversity and tolerance in the belief and faith of others. And I thought that that would be a good way, especially to end with this congregation because you represent one of the most peaceful and um, at your core um, loving congregations that I'm aware of. One, one of my children's godmothers is a Mennonite. So I've been lucky to be involved with her church for a long time. So I wanna thank you very much for your patience. And if you have any questions, if there's any time for questions, I'm happy to take anything. So thank you.